Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and the show has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, as well as being listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. Very grateful for the recognition, and I'm very grateful for all of you who are on this path and on this journey. I love reading what you have to write, your comments and your listens and subscriptions and feedback. You guys are awesome, I just wanna say, and as you can see, I do write back. I really do follow what you present. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dean here in Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. And I thank them for their support. And if you would like to become a facilitator or take one of their classes, go to Dr. Dean here. That's D-A-I-N-H-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I teach business owners, entrepreneurs, coaches, speakers, and healers the steps in order to write a highly engaging page turner book. I am a book writing coach and I run a visibility hub. And in that hub is book writing. And the second piece of the hub is taking people's books to a guaranteed international bestseller. I do all the heavy lifting and it's fully done for you. And the third piece of the hub is showing people like yourself exactly how to get interviewed on podcast and radio and have massive results by virtue of doing this. And so if you would really like to get some information on your own visibility and bumping and up-leveling yourself, well, I'm doing actually a free masterclass today. And I've also got a free gift for you. So the gift includes templates and videos and instructions to get you there so you can become more visible. Go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. And today's show is something I'm excited about because frankly, I have not ever had this conversation in the show. So even after doing this over 14 years is a first for everything, but I'm hungry for this information because this episode features a woman who's an author, a wheat, a witch, a priestess, and who sees and communicates with fairies and elementals. My guest is Morgan Daimler, who writes about Irish myth and magical practices, fairies, and related subjects. Her writing has appeared in multiple magazines and anthologies, including Pagan Dawn and Naming the Goddess. Morgan has presented papers on the intersection of fairies and fiction for Ohio State University's Fairies and the Fantastic Conference, as well as the All Met by Moonlight Conference. Morgan is the author of fiction and nonfiction books, including the urban fantasy paranormal romance series Between the Worlds and bestsellers, Fairy Witchcraft, Fairies, Pagan Portals, and Pagan Portals Bridget. You can find out more about Morgan Daimler's books on Amazon. And if you're listening to the podcast or watching us on YouTube, You can see, I'm not gonna give out the Amazon because it's quite a long URL, but just spell her name. Morgan is the first name and Daimler is D-A-M-I-L-I-E-R. Go check her out and her amazing books. And with that, I welcome Morgan Daimler to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I mean it when I say first time and it wouldn't have happened before, but just to open up me a little bit to you, I have in the last couple of years, I mean, I think always fairies and elementals, fantastical, Mm -hmm. but much like ETs, which I used to be an eye roller about, and I'm now deep in that world that does like, (laughs) I drank the the, the Kool-Aid and I'm, I'm there and I've seen spacecraft, my world's changed. And Mm -hmm. same thing with fairies and elementals. Now I haven't seen them, but I will say I have been in two very distinct national forest situations, completely alone or with my partner. And I am aware, even without seeing them, we are not alone and they are here and this is beautiful. So I'm so excited. So let me start there from somebody who doesn't see, do you actually see and communicate? I do. Um, I mean, I, not everyone does, you know, to be fair, which I understand. And sometimes people will also have just one experience um, or, you know, sort of a random intermittent encounters. 
for me, you know, it's, it's been something since I was very young that I've, um, had it, obviously it's not constant. Um, like a, it's not like in that movie where the kids have the glasses, they put the glasses on and then there's like fairies everywhere, (laughs) but you know, anytime they, they are around, you know, I, I can see them and communicate with them. So how many different forms are there? We say fairies, fey elementals, but what are we talking about? Are they dwarfs, flying creatures? Like what are, what are all of them? Can you give us some names to what they are? Sure. Um, terms like fey and fairy and even elf are kind of generic terms. Um, they really are just a huge number of different things. And there's a lot of things we can find in, in folklore that'll have specific names like dwarves is a good example. Um, brownies, which are kind of house spirit. Um, everyone loves those. They're the ones that clean your house for you. <laughs> I do not have one of those. I'm, I'm open to it though. Like I'll, I'll put that out to the universe. I am open to that. Um, but you have these sort of like specifically named ones and, I found you also have certain things that you'll um, experience sometimes that don't necessarily fit into like a clear category, but are still sort of in that, that realm of it's um, an otherworldly being. It's something that is in that loose category of fairy sort of because of the nature of it. Um, And, you know, I've, for myself, at least, you know, I've, I've seen hounds, fairy hounds, that um, look like dogs, but they don't act like dogs and they, they do things that are inexplicable. Um, one story that I give is sort of a very short version of a much longer story. I was in the city when this happened and there were two of them coming down the sidewalk and my friend and I kind of dodged into my other friend's store and hid because we weren't sure. It was very strange, the whole experience. But when we looked back out, they had already passed in front of us, even though it had only been a a second and it wasn't in long enough amount of time for them to have physically moved. Even if they ran, they had been walking. We went inside, we looked back out and they were past us, but still walking. So something like that, you know, clearly wasn't like, you know, dogs from this world. (laughs) I know it sounds a little funny when I put it that way, but um, you know, there was something else going on with it. Um, are they always little? Are they always very small or do they take different sizes? They can be different sizes. Um, I have certainly seen the smaller ones. So those are out there. Um, you, you can encounter them. Um, the biggest ones I've personally seen are like human sized, mm-hmm. but I, I have heard stories from other people of um, people who have seen and experienced ones that are, are bigger, sort of like where the giants and folklore come from. Um, so there's, there's definitely a range that's out there. Interesting. So yeah, you yeah. write books, Morgan. You write books on this subject. You teach classes. You also involve Irish myth, magical practices, fairies, related subjects. What drew you to this world? You mentioned something about having some skills when you were younger, but what really brought you in here? And in fact, to create a whole career around it. Sure. Um, There's there's so many things that kind of happened and had to line up a certain way to get me where I am today exactly. But um, I am part of the Irish American diaspora, which is just a fancy way of saying my grandfather was from Ireland. Uh So we kind of grew up like with a lot of these ideas and beliefs. And um, when I was very young, as I said, I would see things and experience things. And I would tell my parents, you know, when I was little, I used to write letters for the fairies and put them on the windowsill, like things like that, like little fairy houses. But I think because we had this, this background where that sort of idea, the idea of fairies is a cultural thing, they didn't discourage me. You know, it was always sort of a, oh, okay, you know, we don't, we don't see them, but if you do, that's, you know, that's okay. And I think I hit like 13 or 14 and I started wanting to have some sort of context for these experiences beyond just that, you know, sometimes I would see these things that other people don't see in a, you know, completely sane way. <laughs> Um, I know a lot of times when I talk about this, it sounds like that, but you know, it's like some people can see ghosts. I just, 
happen to see these things. Um, and so I started looking into the folklore and the folk stories and trying to find some sort of foundation, I guess, to help me understand what I was seeing and what I was experiencing. And I think, you know, when I found uh, witchcraft, the religious practice of witchcraft, that to me helped with that foundation because it was something that made sense. Um, you know, it was something that that things that I experienced kind of already fit into that system. And, you know, sort of this combination of me looking at this research and wanting to know, like, other people having these experiences and the history of people having these experiences because people interacting and seeing fairies goes back you know in Ireland goes back well over a thousand years and that helped me feel you know not so alone with it I think and are they all considered nature guardians uh, not all of them uh there's a there's a variety um you know, I think we definitely have uh, what a lot of people today sort of label as like the good fairies and the bad fairies. <laughs> um, Brian Froud has a really great book that's called that actually. And, you know, you definitely have the ones that are more protective and that are protective of certain places and um, will help humans sometimes, you know, and uh, you can, can learn from them, can have connections and, and friendships with them. But you definitely do have the other sort that are, you know, not necessarily as friendly, um, you know, and, and kind of can lean into the more negative stories that we hear about fairies. Um, I actually have uh, recently, someone had contacted me about a um, paranormal situation. They're, they were Ooh, investigating. Detail. Okay. Yeah. They were investigating a haunting and they were starting to suspect that what they were dealing with wasn't a ghost because of some of the things that were going on and sort of by talking with them and seeing what the the symptoms if you will were um, we sort of figured out that no it, it sounds like it's probably fairies or you know something similar elementals um, something along those lines that are just upset with this particular household and are sort of, you know, causing them problems. So they're seeing like shadow figures and stuff is going missing and they're, they're hearing voices and all kinds of, you know, <laughs> less than fun things. Um, and that would be more on that, that negative end of the scale. So there's, there's definitely some variety. So this particular story, was it resolved? Were they able to get somebody in to help them out? It's still in the process. Um, this is actually a conversation I was having uh, two days ago with someone. So they're right now trying to figure out what they can do. Usually with cases like that, something has happened that has upset them, the, the fairies, the spirit beings. And so you have to kind of start with negotiating a little bit and trying to see um, what they're upset about and if you can do anything about that or sort of how you can resolve the situation so everyone's happy again. Um, I had another situation I, I talked about with someone which was resolved where they were doing some work in their yard and they had wanted to install a pool, if I remember correctly, and were digging things up and, you know, all of this. And it was really upsetting, the things that were already there. The fairies, um, he believed they were elementals, um, so they could have been, um, but either way, and was having all these problems because of it. And sort of the resolution was kind of going and having a conversation with them and explaining that they weren't just randomly, you know, digging everything up and causing all this chaos, that there was a purpose to it and setting aside a little space just for those oh, beings. So yeah, so there's, there's usually a way you can kind of work things out. You just have to be aware that they're there you know, and that they consider that space to be their space, even if you as the human, you know, consider it to be yours. You, so sometimes you kind of have to look at it well, almost like roommates, like how can you, how can you learn to get along? Great peace, have a win-win, boundaries, <laughs> yep. all of that. Yep. Oh, boundaries, that's an excellent way to put it. Yes, exactly. You, you need to have firm boundaries with your stuff and you also need to, you know, 
respect that sometimes they have certain boundaries. Yeah, I'm sure do, homes yeah, and, and this is my plot of land and the, that I'm sure does not make sense to them. That's not their reality. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if you know, if there's a particular tree, for example, and as far as they're concerned, it's their tree. Mm-hmm. That's theirs. You know, they for whatever reason it's their home or they use it to pass between this world and their world or whatever is going on. And if it's in your property and you're thinking, well, I want to take it down because I want to build this path, obviously that's going to be a problem, Mm. you know, because as far as they're concerned, it's theirs and they don't want you messing with their tree. So, you know, you can definitely have a lot of property disputes. (laughs) (laughs) This is incredible. Well, what about things like cactus or water, bodies of water? Do they live in those as well? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, And of course, you know, my main focus, as you had mentioned in the introduction, I, I tend to focus more on the Irish mm-hmm. uh, kind of stuff, but there's a lot of things that are native to the United States, things that are here that have been here for a very long time. Um, so really anywhere that you are, you're going to have these beings, um, you know, in, in Europe, they would have been called fairies here. They're called something different, but, you know, generally a very similar sort of concept to what they are. Um, so definitely there's, there's definitely a lot of stuff going on out there. Um, I'm glad you course, brought that up. If you don't mind me interrupting, oh, sure. because we have a friend, Rob and I have a friend, um, this amazing vegan chef who was telling us a story about a trip she took to Iceland where they completely honor the fairies. And they took this evening, late, late evening walk through the ice, up a mountain. It just sounded magical. And all Mm -hmm. along the way were these tiny little groves and candles and um, almost like towns because they believe so much, the Icelandic people in the fairies and the elementals that they built these in honor of them. (laughs) So I was hoping you might talk a little bit, what other countries, there's Ireland, where else, you're even saying United States, where else could we find this? Um, I mean, Specifically, this this level of belief definitely Iceland is huge for it, as you mentioned. Um, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, um, Cornwall, the Isle of Man, uh, to some degree England. Um, English fairy beliefs are kind of interesting because there's a lot of uh, layers to it. I guess we would say um, there's some things there that are much older, and then there's things that are um, kind of newer perceptions, newer ideas. Um, but even if you get into like mainland Europe, France, um, Germany, um, I'm aware of uh, in South America and Brazil, they have uh, spirits, they call them duende uh, in Spanish, but it, it kind of translates to like elf or goblin, kind of that same sort of concept. So, you know, I, I think really when we're talking about fairies and beings that are, are similar to fairies, well, we would call them fairies in English, there, it's kind of a global phenomenon. You know, you can sort of find them everywhere there's humans, I think. And fairies, UFOs, extraterrestrials, is there some kind of a connection or an intersection between them? And if so, what is it? Sure. This is such a fascinating topic. And I have to admit, exactly like you, Mm -hmm. I I had so much, I was relating so much to your introduction of Mm -hmm. yourself at the beginning of this. I was that person at one point who was like, eh, UFOs, aliens, I don't know. But the more I've sort of looked into fairies and the more people have talked about a connection between fairies and UFOs, the less skeptical I've been <laughs> of UFOs and that sort of thing, because there, there is such this a fascinating crossover with mm-hmm. it. And, you know, I don't pretend to know for certain exactly where the lines are, or what's going on, but it is definitely interesting to note that a lot of the characteristics, a lot of the things people describe when they're encountering a UFO or aliens are identical to or very similar to what people would describe in encounters with fairies. Um, things like, you know, lights, seeing lights moving in the trees, um, mm. missing time. Uh, so that's a, a thing people who um, have alien experiences will talk about missing time. We see the same thing with fairies where people who are taken by the fairies or, or go visit with them um, 
will think only a short amount of time has passed and then come back and it's been like three days. Um, you know, so there's, there's definitely that, um, you know, there's just all these similarities that when you compare them side by side, it's like, are they the same thing? Are they just similar phenomena? Um, and of course, nobody agrees on this. Like if you ask people who are really into the ufologist communities, they'll say, well, the old fairy stories were people talking about aliens and UFOs that didn't understand the technology, mm. that didn't understand what that was. If you talk to a lot of people into folklore and into fairies, they're going to say the exact opposite. That like, you know, UFOs and aliens today are sort of the modern sci-fi way of understanding fairy encounters. Um, and it just, it's just such a fascinating thing. You know, there's definitely something going on and it could be both, you know, maybe you have fairies and maybe you have aliens and they, they just have a similar pattern for what they do. Yeah, without me being an expert in this by any means, I am, however, incredibly sensitive and I do know energy, I would say, weighing in completely separate. I love the fact that you talked about where they intersect and that they, there are the similarities and the time loss and the lights and the trees and so forth. I would say, though, the energy is completely different because when I have felt that there were fairies and elementals, for me anyway, it was incredibly light, joyful, playful. It felt like I was a kid again and someone was inviting me to play. I found them really instructive mm -hmm. the last time. They literally found this magical glen and said, come here and lay down. We're gonna, we just want to like nest with you. Mm -hmm. And I looked at, it was kind of a cool space, like dug out, but there were rock, rocks around it. And I thought, how will I put my head? And they were like, no, lay down. This will hold your head. And by God, they were That's right. Different. And yeah, I yeah. just, yeah, I had the most glorious time. And when I was complete there, I then heard they, I was being beckoned into, I, we were definitely in, we were in Kings Canyon, which is a national forest. And it was a beautiful area. And they were beckoning me and saying, come, um, there's a, a cave up here we want to show you. I mean, everything was correct. Mm -hmm. And I was climbing up rocks and flip-flops. And I went into this wild cave in the middle of a very hot summer. And this cave that was cut out like this, there was freezing cold um, air coming from it. God, we were so intrigued. But the better part of ourselves was said, could be bears in there. Or, you know, you don't know. Yeah. Really. We it sounds like a great experience though. Yeah, when I came back, cause we had a, we had a big blanket out. Rob said, I, I sing, I sing in a band and he had this beautiful music on. He said, sing to it. So I was just improvising and, and he was so sweet. He was crying just from the joy of the music. And he was saying how much the fairies were enjoying it. And I, like I, it, my imagination of just, having them around and being able to serve them in a way felt really good. That's all. And they love music. That's, you know, across all the folklore and, you know, my own experience, they, that's a big thing with fairies. They love music. They love performers. They love oh. that kind of energy, I guess you would say. So yeah, that makes complete sense to me. Um, I actually had not an identical experience, but when I was in Iceland, um, cause I was lucky enough to visit there a few years ago, I had something somewhat similar happen where um, I hadn't been feeling well and we were kind of at this really nice um, hotel bed and breakfast sort of place and everyone was out doing their own thing and I went for a walk and I got um, led, I guess we would say, I started seeing mushrooms and I was following the mushrooms because <laughs> that's the sort of person I am. Um, I and can I sort of <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a lot in common. Um, and I ended up being led into this place. It's sort of hard to describe. It's like everywhere else was, um, I mean, it was late in the year over there. So it was what we would say late fall for us, but everything else was very, you know, grassy and trees. And I came into this place and it was like a, an open area in the earth. Um, and it's a lot of it's volcanic over there. So it's black sand. Um, and it was perfectly quiet and felt very um, like I had stepped out of this reality in a way. Mm. Um, and there were little flowers, little purple flowers on the ground. 
And I just felt very calm and very peaceful, um, even though I hadn't been feeling well that day. And, you know, I was sort of told like, you know, just stay here and rest for a minute. And, you know, they showed me where to find this particular rock, which is very unusual. It looked like a geode cut in half, mm. um, but like clear quartz. I'd never seen anything quite like it. And um, then later that night, after I went to bed, I woke up and there were three figures standing around my bed, which normally would upset me, especially in a foreign country. But at the time I wasn't scared. I felt very peaceful and calm and like, okay, you know, this is, this is okay. These are Alfar is what they're called in Iceland. These are elves. Um, and I woke up the next morning and I wasn't sick. I was perfectly fine. Um, and I, I really truly believe they healed me, that that was, what was happening um, and much gratitude to them for that. Cause I did not want to be sick in a foreign country. That was, yeah. That was oh, I love that they recognized you and that you had uh, something that in, in your normal reality state might've been upsetting, but because of their presence and energy and probably your connection with them and their recognition of your gifts, it was actually not only peaceful, but help very healing that they, that they came to your aid. That's really moving. So yeah. yeah, let's shift a little bit into Ireland because you talk about a few of the gods and goddesses of pagan Ireland. So if you don't mind picking out one or two to share any kind of history, any kind of mythology or symbols, I would love, especially if it's active in the world today, the gods and goddesses who are powerful forces that much like your experience can bless us or perhaps otherwise challenge us. Sure. Um, oh, and there's so many to talk about. Um, I guess the, the first one that I would bring up is the Morrigan. Um, she's fairly well known and she's gotten much more popular in the last 10 years, um, which is funny to me because I can remember a time, you know, 20, 30 years ago where you would say her name and people would immediately be like, oh no, you know, stay away from that one. Um, which is unfair. She's, she's super awesome, but you know, it's really moved into a place where she's gained a lot of popularity and people are much more open to her. Um, and I think she gets a bad reputation because she's strongly associated with like war and battle. So people sort of look at that and are immediately like, you know, no. And can you say um, her name again? Oh, the Morrigan, the Morrigan, the Morrigan. Yep. It means a uh, great queen in Irish. Nice. Yep. And, you know, like I said, she gets sort of labeled as this, you know, like dark, scary battle goddess, but there's so much more to her. Um, you know, she, she definitely is associated with, you know, war and battle, but more in the sense of like um, victory and success and overcoming, um, you know, in one of the, the great sort of Irish myths, she shows up to sort of inspire people who are being oppressed to fight against the people that are oppressing them to sort of rise up and, and take back uh, their land and their independence. And, you know, it's a really, really cool story. And she's also associated with things like prophecy and um, sovereignty, you know, the idea of um, not just in the, the larger, you know, king ruling the kingdom kind of sense, but today a lot of people see her with personal sovereignty you know, helping you learn how to um, be whole and complete in yourself and, and really be in charge of your own life, um, which is something a lot of people really struggle with. You know, our, our culture is not always a big fan of that. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so the Mor Morgana, the Morgan, Morgan, I'm going to look this up. I'm, I'm sure she's also beautiful. Um, is there a way, because I some of these things you're saying are really powerful, is there a way that we could call on her to bring her in to help us for things like personal sovereignty and sure, I, beautiful characteristics? I, <laughs> I find her to be really receptive to people just talking to her, mm -hmm. um, you know, just reaching out and saying, um, I, I want to know more about you. I want to connect to you. Um, she is a fairly no nonsense sort of goddess, which I like about her. Um, you know, she's not one for like cryptic signs and subtle messages. 
um, you know, for example, crows and ravens are one of her, her animals. And people who find, who ask for her to be around or who find her energy around will find like flocks of, of crows and ravens showing up um, inexplicably. <laughs> I feel like you find that relatable. I am so blown away right now because I have for decades had this thing with crows. I never asked for it. They absolutely follow me. Uh, they turn up in amazing places. Um, just recently on our block, I mean, it must have lasted one or two months. I don't know if anybody else saw it, but it was like, what is it? A murder of crows, right? Mm -hmm. We're not talking one or two. We are talking about there were so many. I felt like I was on a crow farm. Yeah. I, no, crows are a thing with me, but I also, yeah. am, I feel they're very benevolent and um, I'm moved and humbled by them. Yeah. Well, and, you know, crow is kind of like the Morrigan. They're another of those animals that I think kind of get a bad reputation. It's completely unfair. You know, people tend to see them like, oh, it's a bad omen or, you know, where I live, they get into the garbage a lot. So people don't really like them, but they're, they're extremely smart animals. Um, they're some of the smartest birds that are out there, I think. And they've had all these studies that show like they can use tools and they remember people's faces. Um, you know, they're just, they're, they're very, very intelligent. Yeah. And they're also very caring. Like if you, I'm about to have like a whole crow loving moment. Um, <laughs> if you learn a lot about them, they live in family groups and they'll stay in family groups. Like even after the parents raise um, one group of babies, like, and those babies grow up, they'll still stay with the parents. So you get these like um, extended family groups kind of together. So when you see those big flocks, it's usually birds that are all related or connected to each other. Um, and I just think that's, that's really awesome. You know, they're, they're very cool birds. <laughs> yeah, I, I am with you. And I also understand they're incredibly intelligent. I only see, you know, beauty. I also see a lot of native energy when I look at them. And so Definitely. this, right. And that's, thank you for the trivia about them. That's beautiful. Uh, the Morrigan. So yes. you ask her, I want to know more about you. I want to connect with you. And you're mm -hmm. saying often it will come with ravens or crows, or there'll be other ways or indications. Do people see her or is it a feeling or how does that work? It can be both. And a lot of people will talk about dreams, having dreams with her in them or messages from her. Um, so I think that the key is just opening yourself up to it and, you know, being willing to, to let it in, okay. if you will, uh, you know, ask for it. And then when it comes, you know, acknowledge that it's there. Beautiful. And who else might you talk about that can bless us or challenge us? Sure. Um, another one who, again, has, has recently gained a lot of popularity is a goddess called Bridget. And she's also a Catholic saint. And there's a whole interesting thing about how she was originally a pagan goddess in Ireland. And then um, many people believe she was so popular and so well-loved that when Christianity came in, um, instead of being able to just convince people not to worship her, um, they ended up creating these stories that kind of put her in this role as a saint um, because people were just not willing to give up that connection. Um, I mean, there's other theories as well. People will tell you that, no, there actually was a, a saint by that same name and she's different. But if you look at the stories, there's a lot of similarity. Um, the, the goddess is associated with things like um, healing and poetry, um, Smithcraft, and the saint has very similar kind of things associated with her. Um, the goddess was supposed to be the daughter of a god in the Irish pantheon who's a druid, and um, her mother's name means white cow, um, or at least the goddess, it's probably her mother. And the saint was supposed to have been um, born and then could only be nursed by this white cow and her father was a druid. So you can kind of see like where the stories overlap a bit. Um, but she's a great one for people to connect to because 
Whereas the Morgan is a little more um, how, learning how to be strong in yourself and learning how to like um, exist in a world that can sometimes be difficult. Bridget is sort of the gentle mother who is going to help you through your troubles and um, be sort of that soothing presence when you need it. Um, she, I found her really, really helpful in any sort of situation with grieving or grief. Um, she has a myth that the goddess explicitly has a myth where her son is killed in this battle. And she said to be the first person who mourns the Keens in Ireland, um, which is, you know, very sad, but I found because of that, that like, as a, as a human, if you're in a situation where you're grieving, um, she's an excellent one to sort of call to, or, try to connect to, um, to get that sort of peace and, um, to help you through that difficult time. So, um, I, I'm really fond of her. And of course, if you do anything like poetry or music, she's a good one because <laughs> she's good for that. Okay. Yeah. These are great. Um, it sounds like someday I, I would like to just pick your brain about what else, um, cause we could probably do a whole show on that alone. Oh yeah, there's, there's a lot to that, definitely. Yeah, thanks for teasing that. I appreciate it. So here we are talking about what is possible when you work with these pagan gods, goddesses. I wanna also ask, is there a way that we could practice fairy witchcraft? I was gonna say fairy magic, but fairy witchcraft using rituals, using holidays, magical practices in a way that honors them and that also assists us. Sure. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing, particularly with the fairies, is um, trying to establish friendships and connections. So one of the things that I encourage people to do when they're sort of first starting out with this is to get into a practice, um, you know, whether it's once a week, once a month on the full moon, you know, major holidays, of making a little offering. Um, dairy products are good. If you're vegan and that doesn't work, then like fresh fruit, fresh okay. veggies, um, honey's good, you know, all of, all of that whole range and, you know, just sort of go out and, um, make it clear that you're interested in having a connection, having a friendship with beings who are also interested in that same thing. Cause I, like I said, there's that range of like the more positive ones and the more like mischievous, potentially, you know, going to mess with you ones. So you kind of want to make sure you're, you're aiming for the positive ones. Um, but if you just sort of put it out that way and say, you know, I, I want to connect with the ones who want what's, you know, friendship with me and who are goodly inclined is how I usually phrase it. Like who mean well for me. Um, May I ask you, is that what you mean by the phrase good neighbors? Because I've heard, heard that that's what they're called sometimes. Sure. Um, it's actually, and it's funny, I always use the word fairy, but um, there's a lot of belief, uh, particularly in the um, like Scotland, Ireland, Wales, those areas that you shouldn't call them fairies. You should call them by a euphemism. So good neighbors is one example. Mm -hmm. And the idea is exactly that, that you want to call them good neighbors. So you're sort of bringing up that positive, connecting to the, the positive and not sort of potentially using a term they might not like that can, can get you into that more, you know, bad fairy zone of things. So yeah, there's good neighbors, there's um, good folk, gentry, shining ones. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple different terms that you'll see kind of floating around out there. So talk me through this. I, I have, we have on our property, an amazing tangerine tree. And we have also San Pedro cactus and aloe vera. Those are the ones we tend to go to, to make offerings or prayers, but we've never done them to the fairies, elementals, or good neighbors, or Etc. all the other great names. What, um, yeah. so if I, I have my honey and fruit, let's say, then what would I do next? Um, I mean, I always encourage people to trust their intuition. Um, I think when it comes to this sort of thing, people are, are much more aware of where these beings are 
and where they aren't than we realize we are. Um, I mean, obviously slightly different for me because I, I can sort of see where to go, but um, I find that most people like if, if I say, well, just trust where you need to go to put this, mm -hmm. they'll go exactly where I would have told them to go if I was directing them. Um, you just have to have that trust in yourself. I think that's what trips a lot of people up is they get nervous and start second guessing and thinking, well, you know, why would they want it here? Because this is kind of a weird place or, you know, this is right up against my house. Wouldn't they want it over there? But, you know, usually you just, you just trust that instinct. And if you kind of take your mind out of the equation and just go where you feel you need to go with it, you end up in the right place. So I realize that's, that sounds so vague. No, actually I got it. I don't know. The listeners will have to weigh in on this. I got a huge download when you said that, and I never would have expected this space. And it's actually in our front yard. Um, yeah. So I already know where I would go. Awesome. That's funny because mine is also in my front yard, which I would not have expected. Um, I would have thought, you know, I have about a half acre and half of that is swamp but I would have thought it would be out more towards the swamp because that's got a really interesting wild energy to it. Um, I actually really love my swamp for the record, but um, it wasn't when, you know, I was looking for a place at this house. It was also in the front. I was like, okay, it's a little more like in the middle of everything and active mm. than I would have thought they would have liked, but that's where they want things. So yeah. And then we get there and, and we beckon them in. We make sure we ask for the kind ones, the good ones, because we want a good interaction. And what comes next? Um, the next thing usually that I find for people is you just want to sort of give it a little time. Some people get very quick results. Um, you'll, you'll immediately sort of start. What, what happens to most people is you start seeing things like in your peripheral vision movement, um, but if you turn your head, there's nothing there, that kind of stuff. Um, you'll start feeling more presence, more like something's around you. Um, even the more positive ones sometimes can be a little mischievous. They love to hide car keys. I don't know why. Um, and this, this is not just my experience. Like so many people who interact with um, fairies, uh, particularly here in the U.S., will talk about the same thing that like you put your car keys down on your kitchen counter, you know exactly where they are, and then go away, and then you come back and you need to go somewhere, and your keys are gone, and you search everywhere for them, and you know tear everything apart, can't find it, getting super stressed out, and then turn around and they're literally in the middle of your counter where you thought they were the whole time, except they weren't there before, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and it's, they're not, that's not them trying to be mean. That's more playful kind of energy. I so have, have to sort of. I have had two experiences and I, wow. I thought they were multi-dimensional experiences but you're giving me a very unique point of view, Morgan that I never considered till this conversation. This happened with jewelry and it happened with a dress. Um, I went to, I have, a lot of jewelry, I'll be honest. And I have a very particular cash that is like the favorite of the favorite, the most powerful that I wear. And it means everything. And they were our unique pieces you can't get anywhere else. And I went to put them on during COVID for whatever reason. And when I say gone, I mean ripped this house apart over and over and over again, because I don't give up easily. And I finally decided that this place we had gone to in September in Arizona, oh my God, I left, I know it. I left them in the safe in the hotel room, called the hotel and I mean, nothing. Mm -hmm. And I, on one hand, I surrendered. On the other hand, I was bereft and I could not in my mind let it go because I would never find a piece or pieces like that again. Mm -hmm. And nine months went by. And one day I went someplace, I have some tiny electrical equipment in the bedroom that I went to get. I know exactly, because this thing is so little, I know exactly what's in there and I open it up and I just, oh, 
how is this possible? All of my jewelry, my watch, my rings, my beautiful earrings, like the whole cash right it there. All in there. And I just assumed I had demanifested and manifested it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same case in point. I went to a store. There was this beautiful dress. And I, I was like, mm, you know, sort of like a casual shirt dress. And it's this pride. Mm -hmm. But I never forgot about it. It looked really awesome. And I finally went, I'm going to go get it. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the store. I picked it up and, the, you know, I put it in this beautiful little bag. I am telling you, I don't know somehow when I came back from the store, but I never saw the dress again. Never. Huh. With beautiful olive green dress. And again, ripped everything apart. And then I decided I must have been so like so verklempt. <laughs> At some point I threw it out, not realizing how, and I, I was very sad. Mm -hmm. And I tried to find the dress again online, never, never, never. And then one day, almost a year later, my boyfriend is getting ready for work and he pulls this thing and he says, I don't even like, I don't know what this is. And I said, what is that? And he goes, yeah, no, I found it in my shirts. And, I, and it's my dress. Yeah, okay. And he says, and it has a stain on it. And yeah. so it still had tags, everything. And I awesome. mean, what are the odds? This has happened to my sister-in-law too. Like great, yeah. she bought me a Christmas gift. Boom. And she ripped everything apart. And then all of a sudden it comes back. So you're saying fairies. So what are they doing for nine months? Are they sitting in the background? <laughs> <laughs> what is well. that? Possibly. I mean, they could be. I think also we have to remember that time can work a little differently sometimes with them. So, so they may have the dress sure. for a minute and for me, it's a year. <laughs> Something like that. I think sometimes. Um, I've never had it happen with clothing, but I have had some weird things happen with jewelry like that. Um, I had had a bracelet that a friend had made for me. Um, it's Appetite and Garnet. It was really pretty. Mm. And we had moved. Um, we had moved from one town to another. It was a whole big production and I couldn't find the bracelet. And I figured, okay, you know, it got left behind or it got thrown out in the course of, you know, how chaotic it is when you're moving. Yeah. And I was moving at the time with like a two-year-old. So it was extra chaotic and, you know, I was sad about it, but it is what it is. And then maybe two, three months go by and I walked into the bathroom one day and it was in the middle of the bathroom floor. And I was like, <laughs> there's no explanation for it. Like it, no idea. Um, and I had had a ring that was, you know, basically I'd bought it for myself for my first mother's day. It had a lot of sentimental value, even though I got it for myself, it was still very important to me. <laughs> and I used to take it off at night and I would put it up on the shelf and I got up one morning and it wasn't there. And I just figured, okay, you know, I, must have taken it off and put it down somewhere else, looked everywhere, could not find it, eventually sort of accepted that it must have gotten knocked off the shelf and who knows where it ended up. And it was, it was a good amount of time later, five or six months, maybe. Um, I don't smoke. So in my car, the ashtray, I keep spare change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is like if you happen to need a quarter for something or whatever Absolutely. you have right there. And I had reached in to, to get some spare change and there was my ring. And I was like, again, no explanation because I never would have put it there. And I had gone in and gotten change and added change over the course of that six months. So it could not have been there the whole time. So fairies. Yeah, so fairies. <laughs> That's great. And yeah, it's, if people, it's, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to say, it's, it seems like it's their way of letting you know they're there. Hmm. And it's kind of like them saying that they like you in that I'm teasing you like you sort of way. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, they certainly got my attention, but I'm so <laughs> glad we're talking about this because it really puts a different spin. Hmm. Um, it makes life interesting. It really does. Yeah. It's and I'm not mad about it. So I hope they're listening. I'm sure they are. <laughs> I'm sure they're here with us now. So for all of those fairies here with us and all of you now, and are there benefits for us interacting with these beings and connecting to them? What are the benefits? Definitely. Um, I mean, obviously I'm going to say yes to this because 
that sort of, you know, a lot of things in my life are sort of based on um, my belief, at least, that these beings are positive and helpful to me. Um, there's certain things that I've been taught, like in dreams in particular, they communicate a lot in dreams um, that I never would have known otherwise. Um, you know, uh, things that relate to particularly like my practice of witchcraft, which is something that's a little more personal, but, um, you know, use of certain things for like cleansing purposes, healing purposes, um, you know, things like that. So there's, there's definitely the benefit that they will engage with you and teach you, um, teach you things. Uh, obviously, as I'd mentioned, the healing, um, I had that example in Iceland, um, I have another healing example, which, you know, I um, have only shared a, a few times with people because it's super personal. And it also like, to me, it's kind of miraculous, except, you know, fairy miraculous um, as opposed to, you know, higher power miraculous. But uh, my middle child has a lot of health issues. And at one point when she was, I say 11 or 12, she was diagnosed with scoliosis. And this was on top of a lot of other things that she was already dealing with. And, you know, I don't know if you know how that works, but you have to go to the doctor or the orthopedist so often, and they check like how the curve is progressing in the back. And it was getting to a point where they were like, well, we're going to have to probably look at putting her in a back brace to try to correct it. And there was multiple reasons why that was going to be really, really problematic for her <laughs> um, and not going to go over well. So I kind of had gone um, to the fairies, the ones that are, are connected to me that I, that I feel close to and was just like, you know, I, I need for this not to happen basically because it's just a mess and she, she's got enough stuff that she's going through and dealing with. And this is like just one thing too many basically. And it was, I think it was either three months later or six months later. I think it was three months later. We went back. And they always do an x-ray and he took the x-ray and came in and basically her back was straight. Um, and I actually have the x-rays. Like I can prove this. This is not just me making up a creative story. Um, the curve was almost completely gone. There, it, tiny, tiny, you can barely see it, but it was almost completely gone. Um, and I asked him, uh, you know, cause he's a, a pediatric specialist with this you know, how often do things like this happen? And he was basically like, well, this doesn't happen. Like scoliosis doesn't, you know, resolve itself. Um, it only gets worse or they have to do something to correct it. And, you know, the doctor said, I, I have no explanation for what's going on with this or, you know, how this happened. And then they had us keep coming back to keep monitoring her because I don't think he trusted it. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, yeah. But, and that, that is, like I said, it's a true story. I have the x-rays. Um, cause I, I know it sounds super unbelievable, but, and I, I truly believe it was, you know, thanks to, to them. So I, I do think that when it comes to fairies, you know, and healing, it's not always going to be like that extraordinary, but they definitely can, you know, help people with things like with physical things, with health things. So wow, def That's definitely a, a reason. Yeah. yeah. So it's fair to say that fairies have changed your life. Oh, definitely. Um, definitely. And I mean, there's, there's definitely challenges that come with it. Um, you know, clearly being an expert in this and, you know, um, being someone who uh, talks about being able to see these beings and being connected to these beings. It's not always something that makes your life easier, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I really do feel like there's, there's so many things that are blessings in my life because of them and because of that connection to them. And, uh, you know, beyond everything else, just having that presence and, um, like you said, uh, when you were talking about your story before, um, those moments of feeling just almost like pure joy with them around. Um, I wouldn't trade that for anything, you know, 
even if I get to be the crazy fairy lady. <laughs> well, everybody needs one. So <laughs> I'm glad it's you. I have to say, <laughs> Morgan, I'm so glad you came on the show and I'm going to spell your last name for people. It's Morgan Daimler and it's D-A-M-I-L-I-E-R, Amazon. So if I go to Amazon, if we go to Amazon to check out your books, I'm intrigued. Um, so some of them are factual and information-based, and some of them are novels? Yes. Yep. I, the majority of my books, um, and I am embarrassed to admit I have a lot of books, um, but the majority yes, of my books a lot. Have, um, are nonfiction. So I have um, a lot of books about Irish paganism. I have a lot of books about fairies. Um, I do some translation from older Irish uh, into English. So just like everyone needs a weird hobby and that's mine so that's a cool hobby what a conversation yeah. starter <laughs> yeah it, it definitely um gets people's attention <laughs> um but it's fun you know and a lot of the the really old stories there's only a few versions in English available and they're not always the best so I thought it would be uh fun this is my idea of fun to look at the originals and then do you know newer versions for people um so I've, I've got that out there um and then yeah I write fiction um that actually I, to be fair that actually is my fun hobby um I just enjoy it it's fun to tell stories uh like that urban fantasy so sort of the idea of our world but if if everyone could see elves and fairies and all of that and interact with them and are your books also available in audible um, two of them are. Uh, my book, um, Fairy Witchcraft, is Fairycraft. I should say it would help if I can remember the title of my own books. Fairycraft um, is, and then my book, Fairies, um, A Guide to the Celtic Fair Folk, which is usually the one I recommend most people start with because it's sort of a, a basic guide to what these beings are and how to interact with them and, and sort of all of that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. This is Dare to Dream, Morgan. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? You've created all this amazingness and you're a prolific writer and you're immersed in this beautiful world. What, what's next for you? What's your big yummy dream? Um, you know, I have to be honest. I think I am kind of living my dream right now, um, yeah. which, which is awesome. Um, you know, I, again, that sounds a little weird to say, but it's true. Um, you know, I'm in a place in my life where I can, can write and I can get, you know, things out to help people, which is important to me. And, you know, I can, I can do the fiction for fun and then I can write the nonfiction, which is the more serious informational stuff. And I, I get to be guests on, on wonderful shows like yours. So um, I, I'm honestly pretty happy. Well, I'm happy to, to know going. you. Yeah, keep it going, please, because you're covering an area I have not, you know, I say so humbly, but I've not been able to explore yet. And I'm leaving here wanting more. I'm curious yeah. about much more. So thanks for opening up that door for me and all the listeners. And we'll have to have you back. This was great. Awesome. Right, great, great. Yeah. yeah, it definitely sounds like you have a lot of that fairy energy going on around you. So important to open up to it. Absolutely. If you feel it, it's probably real. I'll just yep. say. Thanks, Morgan. And I end today's show with this quote from Dora Van Gelder Kuntz. We must remember that the whole business of seeing fairies is a delicate operation at best. The power to see requires conditions of quiet and peace. And then fairies are themselves quite as shy as wild creatures and have to be tamed and attracted. I hope you will tune in next week to this number one transformation conversation. Next week, I'm featuring Grandmother Flor de Mayo, who is a curandero espiritu, or a healer of divine spirit. As a seer, Grandmother has the ability to see other realms of color, light, and sound. She was born in Nicaragua under the Maya astrology seed sign and has the ability to see the effects of existing imbalances on the physical, emotional, and spiritual realms within a person's energy system. Remember to subscribe 
to this number one transformation conversation. Leave your comments, like the show, and recommend it to your friends who you know will enjoy this. I thank you so much for being on this journey, and may you have a mischievous, magical day. Thanks for joining us.